Right, we're all in Second Corinthians five seventeen. Let's have a brief prayer. Lord, we've uh, prayed this morning, and I merely wish to add that that I pray that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, our strength and our wonderful Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of the sermon is God's Christmas Message of Reconciliation. Actually, annually, we need to remind ourselves of why Jesus came, and he said his kingdom is not of this world. And in John 16, 28, he said, I came from the Father, and I entered the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. So what did he come here for? What did he enter the world to do? What was his mission? So first we're going to look at God's Christmas message to the world, and then what was his Christmas message to you and me as believers? Colossians 1.19 says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through Jesus, and here it is, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So he, he came, his whole purpose was to reconcile to himself all things. Well, what does it mean to reconcile people to God? Or, or what does even the word reconcile mean? The American Heritage Dictionary defines reconcile as to establish friendship between two hostile parties to settle or resolve a dispute. Give an example of this. Um, during the Civil War, of course, the North and the South experienced great, great hostilities towards each other. Uh, then the war ended. Then time went by and Jefferson Davis, who's the president of the Confederate States, he died. Then Ulysses S. Grant of the Union he died, and then would you believe their two widows, Verena Davis and Julia Grant, settled near each other and they became the closest of friends. That's a, a case where time eventually brought about reconciliation. Well, that's not what we're talking about today exactly, but we need to ask the question, why do people need to be reconciled to God? Well, the first man sinned and reproducing after his own kind, as Genesis said that he would, he gave birth to a race of people whose very nature was to be hostile to God. Romans 8, 7 says the sinful mind is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law. So as a result of this, God cursed man. Man was cursed and he was left to face the consequences of his sin, sorrow, suffering, and death. But of course, it wasn't only man that was cursed. God, as we're told in Genesis, also cursed all of creation, which is why Colossians says he came to reconcile to himself all things. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, God declares to the first man, cursed is the ground because of you, and through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, and it will produce thorns and thistles for you. Thorns and thistles being the emblems of that curse. And bearing that curse, as he bore our sins, the Lord bore that emblem as he wore a crown of thorns on his brow. Thus, at the return of Christ, uh, God's completed work will be that through Jesus, God reconciled all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, peace through his blood shed on the cross. And, of course, it is through repentance and faith, a faith that accepts Christ's reconciliation, that he went to the cross, bore your sin, bore the punishment of that sin, that, as the dictionary tells us, God reestablishes friendship between two hostile parties namely you and me and him, us and him. Romans 5.10 says that when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Now, somebody might say, well, enemies, you know, I may not be a Christian, and uh, in fact, I may be an atheist, but I, I, I don't picture myself as being an enemy of God. Well, you need to. 
because God created you and me and human beings to love, serve, worship, obey him, and you live as if he didn't exist. Uh, you have no idea of God's righteous requirements. Uh, if you did, you would have a better idea of how far beneath those standards that you have fallen. And the Lord Jesus makes it very clear that if you are not born again, and you are therefore not actively for him, you are actively against him. Before a person is reconciled to God, that is made right with God, Ephesians 2, 3 says that like the rest, <coughs> you are by nature an object of the wrath of God. Ephesians 2, 12 says at that time, you are separate from Christ without hope and without God in this world. That is God's Christmas message, by the way, to the world, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. But lack of faith that submits it results in perishing. Be reconciled to God. Okay, so what is God's Christmas message to us as believers? Well, that brings us to our passage in 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 17. Therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we've been given the, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't God give that to the angels? I mean, they're good at this sort of thing. Good, good question, good question. Because, you see, angels have been repeatedly used by God to bring very important messages to people. Um, in fact, actually, the word angel in Greek is angelos, and that means, literally, a messenger. Well, you, you can look through, through the New Testament, and you see them doing this, and they're, they're brilliant at it. And so they should be. They're holy angels. They're not even imperfect. In Luke 1.13, an angel delivers a message to Zechariah and tells him that his wife is going to give birth to John the Baptist in their old age. You go to Luke 1.35, and an angel is telling Mary that she's going to conceive and give, uh, bring forth a child, saying, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that that Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God of God. Isn't that, isn't that marvelous? In, Ma in Matthew 2.13, an angel warns Mary and Joseph about Herod's plot to kill their son and instructs them to immediately leave to be safe in Egypt. Uh, in Luke 2.13, you see the, the whole night sky lit up as the, the angels proclaim the birth of Jesus to the, to the shepherds. And it, it just makes sense that angels would be the obvious choice to bring the gospel. What's the gospel? It's God's Christmas message of reconciliation to the whole world. But what does our text say? Our text says he is committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now that's to you and me. Well, so why not give it to angels seeing they're so good at delivering messages? Uh, permit me to forward a proposal. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 says that God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God, which is just a, another way of saying what qualifies us to comfort other people in trouble is having experienced the same trouble ourselves and having been divinely comforted ourselves. Well, that being true, the holy angels would be the wrong people, wouldn't they, to share the gospel? They can share all these other messages, but, but an angel can't sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because they don't have any testimony. They have no testimony whatsoever about being rescued from depravity. Angels are, in fact, though, to some degree, or to perhaps a large degree, involved in reconciling sinners to God. It's just not as proclaimers of the gospel. Hebrews 1.14 says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those 
who will inherit salvation. For, for example, in Acts chapter 12, where Peter is thrown in prison and God sends an angel to break the prison doors so that he can be freed. Um, you might remember when I was preaching a series some time ago on angels that I, I told you the story of John Patton, who was the missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. And one night, hostile natives, they surrounded his mission station in order to burn him and his wife out of the house so that they could kill them. Well, dear old Patton and his wife, they spent the whole night praying this, 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 this night of terror and asking God to deliver them. Well, when the sun came up, they went outside and to their great delight, but great surprise, the, these attackers had, had vanished. Well, one year later, the chief of that hostile tribe was converted to Christ. And remembering what had happened, Patton asked the chief why they didn't go ahead and burn the whole house down and take them out and kill them. And, and the chief replied in somewhat surprise, well, how could we do that with all of those men there? And Patton didn't know of any men that were there. Well, the chief insisted that he was afraid to attack because he said there were hundreds of large men in shining uniforms with swords around your, around your house. Billy Graham in his book on angels, he wrote on many occasions in the pulpit, God has become especially real, and he has sent his unseen angelic visitors to touch my body. Let me be his messenger for heaven, speaking as a dying man to dying men. So, why did Jesus come? Uh, verse 19, he was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's <clears throat> sins against them. What is his Christmas message and calling to those who have been reconciled and been made right with God? He goes on to say he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And this is in the context of why he came. Verse 20 goes on to say, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Dr. Wilbur Chapman was uh, a, a famous evangelist and he wrote, the New Testament tells of 40 people all suffering from sin who were healed by Jesus. Of this number, 34 were either brought to Jesus by friends or Jesus was taken to them by them. In only six cases out of 40 did the sufferers find their way to Jesus without assistance. And then Chapman adds, of the vast number of people who find their way to Jesus today, most of them reach him because the friends of Jesus were concerned about the welfare of their souls. Now, somebody's going to say, but I don't know what to say. I, 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 how, how, how could I possibly find a way to reconcile people to God? Well, there's good news. Uh, you don't have to find a way. Notice the end of verse 19. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we've already been handed the message. Jude 3 puts it this way. It says, dear friends, I felt I had to write to you to urge you to contend for the faith. Now notice, that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. So we've already been entrusted with the message. In 2 Peter 3, 2, Peter says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the prophets. There's your Old Testament's 39 books. And the command given by the Lord and Savior through his apostle. Apostles. There's the New Testament's 27 books. He says, that's the jurisdiction of anything I want you to remember. Well, yeah, but that's the whole Bible. I don't know the whole Bible. I, get a, I, 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 I hardly know any of the Bible. Well, you probably know little because you, you, you were saved, weren't you? You know that all God expects of us in sharing this message and being the, message, uh, the messengers of reconciliation is to just simply say what you do know. He'll never hold you accountable for more than that and, and to share what it is that you have seen. That, that's true for every single person involved in the, in the reconciliation story. In Luke 2.20, the shepherds returned glorifying God and praising God publicly for all the things they had seen and heard. You remember when, when Jesus sent John the Baptist's disciples back to him, back to John the Baptist? 
Jesus told them to be witnesses of him and he told them what they would be responsible for. Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. That's all. In John chapter 3, we see that this is actually all that Jesus did. Jesus said, speaking of himself, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth, he belongs to the earth, and therefore he speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven, namely me, is above all. And he testifies to what he has seen and what he has heard. All we're being asked to do is just say what you know, and people will be held accountable for that. Uh, if you think about uh, a witness in court, a witness in court is merely responsible for bearing witness to whatever they have seen and whatever they have heard. They don't need to be an expert at anything other than that. And if they haven't seen or heard much, but they've seen a little or heard a little, they're responsible to share that. Well, what if you feel that you really don't know any scriptures at all? <laughs> uh, well, then you can share your testimony. You can tell people, well, this is what God did for me. By the way, you know, the, only, the time when that opportunity arises is, is if you become better at listening to people's problems. Everybody wants somebody who will listen to their problems. And once you've listened to their problems, you can always say, well, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. In John 4, 39, it reports that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. You know what the woman's testimony was? Jesus told me everything I ever did. That's all, that's all, she, that's all, all she knew to say. Is come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. This is enough to have them interested. They, they, they believe this might well be the Messiah. Uh, of course, people don't get saved by listening to somebody else's experience. They've got to actually come and hear the truth themselves. And, and that's precisely what happened here. Because these people went on the basis of her testimony, they said, well, we've got to go hear for this, uh, about this ourselves. And in verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe now because you, of what you said, we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man is really the savior of the world. So this is just telling us, all God's asking is just, if, if this is all you can do is just say, this is what he's done for me, and invite them to church and let them hear for themselves. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 2, Daniel said, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High had done for me. Uh, in Mark 5, 19, Jesus heals somebody, and then he tells them, now you go home, and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. I don't know if that guy was educated or what, uh, or, or uneducated, more than likely, but, but he was, Jesus was saying, you can do that. Okay, but here's the problem, you see. I'm really timid. I'm a, I'm a timid soul, and I just don't know that I have the heart for you know, telling somebody what God has done for me. It seems a bit personal. Well, if you're born again, then you have already been given the heart for lost people. Really? Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come, and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself in Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So notice, God makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus so that you'll be fully equipped to be a minister of reconciliation. And if in faith you share your faith, you know what? You're going to discover the thing that those who do that discover, which is there's no joy like knowing that, that you talk to somebody about Christ and maybe a year down the road that they got saved. It's, it, there's an amazing joy in that. Uh, in Spurgeon, Spurgeon's autobiography, he wrote, How my heart leapt for joy when I heard the tidings of my first convert. If anybody had said to me, somebody has left you 20,000 pounds, I shouldn't have given a snap of my fingers for it compared with the joy that I felt when I was told that God had saved a soul through my ministry. He said, I felt like a boy who has earned his first guinea. 
that is, if you want to know what a guinea is, a guinea is a pound and one shilling in the days when a shilling was 20, they were 22 to a pound. <laughs> Forget that, it's, but I just want you to know it's not a pet. We're not talking about a pet. Um, <laughs> I, like the boy, I felt like the boy who's earned his first guinea, or like the diver who'd been down to the depths of the sea and brought up a rare pearl. Well, she, but okay, I'm hearing all this, but it's gonna be hard for me. I mean, I, I could just cry at the thought of it. Well, Psalm 126, verse six was written for you, because it said, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. God's already given us a heart for this, to bring others. You know, uh, I was reading this week about a, a missionary medical doctor in one of China's hospitals who, had, who reported that, that a few weeks after he had cured a man of cataracts, he said, would you believe a 48 blind men showed up from one of China's outbacks and they were all holding onto a rope guided by the man who'd been cured. These people had walked in a chain gang for 250 miles because the guy who had been cured told others about it. Okay, but, but, but you see, I've, I've, I've read Romans 8, 7. I mean, you quoted it just a minute ago, and it says that the, the, the lost people are hostile to God and will not submit to God's laws. Well. What if they're hostile to me? Well, never mind, or laying aside for a moment the possible ho hostility towards you, the great question is, is what is it gonna overcome their hostility towards God? And it's not us keeping silent. It's what? Roman, Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Blood of the Lamb is the, the story of Christ's death on the cross, his work on the cross. That's the gospel, and by the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their life so much as to shrink even from death. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if they're so hostile to the gospel, are there any out there that will respond? In John 4, 35, Jesus answered this question, and he said, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're, they're ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages, and even now the harvest, he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. And this statement, the fields are ripe for harvest, means that his elect are everywhere who will positively respond. You know how encouraging that is, is to find out that you're, you're actually being sent out into a world where there is a scattered elect who will believe. And, and some of them are not, the, not the, the, the people you would ever expect. You know, that should be a great encouragement. The Apostle Paul had to be encouraged this way. You'd think he was just such a barging fellow that he didn't ever need encouragement. Well, he did. In Acts 18, 6, it says the Jews opposed Paul so much that they became abusive. Paul shook out of his clothes in protest and he said, your blood is on your own head. I'm now going to the Gentiles. Now, Paul is apparently so discouraged that God has to encourage him. Listen to how God encourages him. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and said, don't be afraid. Can you imagine Paul being afraid of witnessing? Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent because, ready for it? Because I have many people in this city. These are people who haven't heard the gospel yet. There's been no preacher gone to them yet. He, and yet God says they're mine. They're mine. Be encouraged. They're waiting to hear from you. They don't know it, but they are. And you see, this got into Paul's thinking. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul said, I'm a servant of God and an apostle. That's one who is sent of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect. And in 2 Timothy 2.10, he says it again. I endure everything for the sake of God's 
elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. You've been sent to go out and share the message to, or your testimony to, the elect. Because they will hear. I don't have the knowledge. Well, then just tell them what God's done for you. Listen to their problem and then tell them what God did for you. Invite them to church. Uh, I'm timid. I, I, I forgot the heart for the lost. You do if you're born again. You're a new creature. Well, but I don't have the strength to share my faith. Notice verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You ever thought about that? When you share the Bible that God is actually speaking through you. He's speaking through us, it says right there. And there's a lovely passage in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, where Paul says, we don't distort the word of God, on, on the contrary, and now he's going to say, this is all we do. We set forth the truth plainly, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel fail, well, it's failed to those who are perishing. He said, just, 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 we just share the word, stick it out there, and leave it to men and their consciences before God. That's all. But, 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 I, but I'm still feel I don't have the power to do that. I, I, I need the power to share it. No, you don't if you're born again. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So if you're saved, you do have the power. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, you, you, try, you try being brave and, and, and listening to somebody's problem and then saying, I'll tell you what God did for me. And uh, you'll be amazed how the power will come upon you. Yeah, but I mean... Power to share it, maybe, but I, I don't have any power to, to change somebody's life. I don't have any power to convert people. Uh, where do I get that from? You'll, you can ask for it, but you'll never get it because that's not your department. You don't need the power to convert people. So, so, so if anybody's going to be converted, where's the power going to come from? Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The power is in the message. You, you, you just need enough power to go do what you don't want to do, but do it in faith, and then the power will come upon you as you're doing it. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul says something interesting because a lot of us think, well, yeah, but I don't have the gift of the gab. I, 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 I don't know how to be convincing, you know? I'd be convincing. And Paul says in 2 Timothy, Corinthians 2.17, in Christ we simply speak before God with sincerity, like, like men sent from God. You don't need to be convincing. You just need to be sincere. So as we conclude, what again is the Christmas message of reconciliation that has been given to us as believers? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So reconciliation, reconciliation, peace with God, can, getting right with God, can only be made through Jesus Christ. And when that happens, it results in a great change. You become a new creature. You're born again. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. It is through Jesus and through Jesus only that your sins will never be counted against you. Well, so, so what does God do with my sins so that they will never be counted against me? Verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made, become the righteousness of God in him. So on the cross, God took your sins, placed it on Christ. He bore the punishment for it in your place. What he requires of you is to acknowledge your sin and, and, and believe in the gospel. And someone who is an enemy of God will be reconciled to God. Uh, Romans 5.10 just first we quoted before, but it didn't quote all of it. it. says, for when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be kept saved through his life? Which is saying that, that if Christ's death made us right with God, well, if it saved us, well, how much more will his life result in us being kept saved? Because Hebrews 7 says he ever lives to intercede for us. 
That's just another way of saying when God reconciles a person to him, it is permanent. Unlike that Protestant church in North Berlin that's actually called the Church of Reconciliation, but that now stands abandoned because they had a church split and nobody could reconcile. <laughs> it's better than that. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors and God is making his appeal to the world through us. So may we, as a prayer, with God's help, implore men and women on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's God's Christmas message of reconciliation for the world and for us. Let's pray.